Turner from uh, Scott and White. She is the <coughs> director of the, the kidney and pancreas program there. Uh, she did her training, uh, undergrad and medical training in Ireland before coming to the United States, doing general surgery at Galveston, and then a transplant fellowship at the University of Texas in Houston. Um, she went on a few years later to do a dedicated pancreas transplant fellowship at the University of Minnesota and has a pretty uh, vast experience in pancreas transplantation. Um, once again, she's presently the director of kidney and pancreas at Scott and White. I mean, um, yeah, at Baylor Scott and White. I got to get used to the new name. And uh, today, she's going to talk to us about her experience in pancreas transplant. I'll let you read the title there. She'll give you, I hope, a background on what that means. The the surgeons know what that means, right. but uh, the rest of you may not be aware. Great. Uh, I think my microphone is on. <clears throat> So thank you for having me. It's uh, quite a privilege to be here. Um, I have a fair amount of experience with pancreas transplant. I don't know about vast experience. But uh, after you've done a few, you probably feel like you've got a vast experience. Um, I think the old adage where, you know, you eat when you can, sleep when you can, and don't, you know what, with the pancreas uh, is sort of upset here as a pancreas transplant surgeon. And um, there's a reason that there are not a whole lot of pancreas transplanters because it is a challenge. And uh, we'll talk about some of those challenges, but also some of the incredible uh, reasons why one should take on those challenges. So um, I don't have anything to declare, but like all transplant surgeons, I am a little opinionated. We all talk about uh, literature and, and uh, studies. But to some extent, we carry with us our biases and our own experience, and it's very difficult to get away from that. That's just the way it is. So we all know diabetes is a big problem. Certainly, it's a huge problem, if you'll pardon the pun, in this country. And we know that diabetes is a disease which just takes. It causes vascular disease, so it takes from people, whether it's their kidney function, their vision, their limbs, and a lot of their sensitivities. It's a pretty miserable disease. And it's a big problem. And it's only going to get bigger. The problem, of course, when we talk about transplanting patients who are diabetic is trying to distinguish one patient from another in terms of, because it is a spectrum of disease. We all recognize the classic caricature of the type 2 diabetic, overweight. We all recognize the caricature of the thin type 1 diabetic. But there's a lot in between. So <clears throat> although we make the distinction, and certainly for uh, listing and with the new allocation system for kidney and pancreas, we do make this somewhat artificial distinction between type 1 and type 2. There's a huge gray area in between what we call sort of type one and a half. And you'll often, you know, when people talk about type one and type two, it's based on some nebulous reason that they're, they're diagnosed that way because very often you can't tell from looking at the patient what kind of diabetic they are. So to get away from this concept of type one and type two, to realize that it is a spectrum of disorder and that there is a, quite a difficulty sometimes making the diagnosis of what type of diabetic you are. So when I see a patient and I'm thinking about them in terms of a kidney and a pancreas transplant, I have to think about them in terms of how much they're going to get through the surgery, how much impact a pancreas transplant is going to make on their uh, current daily lives and the quality of their existence and also their future kidney function. We take a lot for granted. You know, insulin hasn't been around that long in terms of our understanding. I know insulin has been around a long time, but we really haven't known about insulin or understood insulin for more than 100 years. So we're in a very sophisticated era of uh, medicine now, but we're really standing on the shoulder of many giants because uh, we have, first of all, had to identify this magic substance that did so much. The pancreas for some reason, has these beautiful little islets nestled in this potentially hostile environment. Because wouldn't it be great if you just had 
an islet of Langerhand with the blood vessel going in and the blood vessel going out that you could hook in to somebody and that way you could solve their diabetes. But we know that these islets, which are nestled in the endocrine, in the exocrine pancreas, which makes it the challenging part of the operation, gets a huge blood supply compared to the size. It only accounts about 1% of the total weight of the gland, and yet it gets about 10% of the blood supply. So there's some crosstalk between the exocrine and the endocrine pancreas. There's some important relationship between those two structures that give us this ability to maintain our euglycemic state. So it's not just all insulin. There are other things that are going on as well. So when we talk about giving people whole organ pancreas transplants, we're giving them this complex, this <coughs> interplay between the endocrine and the exocrine pancreas, which seems to be hugely important. Before you undertake such a, uh, a challenging uh, transplant, though, you have to ask yourself, if we fix people's blood sugar, will it fix their vascular disease? And the answer is yes. This was a landmark study for some of the students in the audience, which had to be halted. This basically took about 1,400 patients, half of which had no retinopathy and half had retinopathy. And they then uh, were placed into two different groups, patients who had intensive insulin management and patients who had standard insulin management. They had to halt the trial because what happened was patients with intensive insulin management did better. They either didn't develop retinopathy or they stabilized the retinopathy they had. So insulin worked to stabilize vascular disease. The problem, however, was that there's a price to pay. So intensive insulin therapy does work. And that's why you'll see a lot of patients will run their blood sugars high because hypoglycemia will kill you. And certainly in a, in a classic type 1 diabetic, <clears throat> hypoglycemia will injure your brain. And, and it's very sad to see patients who have had repeated episodes of hypoglycemic <coughs> uh, unawareness, and they have uh, irreversible brain damage. Again, just to put it in perspective where we're at, the first transplant done back in 1966, these were very brave souls because actually the outcome with this particular transplant, the, the, the uh, survival of the graft and the survival of the patients were, were pretty poor. Uh, I think the uh, graft survival was like 20% uh, and the patient survival 39% over one year. So, but they persisted and then we all know this very important person in the history of pancreas transplantation, David Sutherland, quite the gentleman, a very smart man. And he really is a pancreas champion insofar as he saw these patients with a need and uh, pursued the uh, development of both islet and solid organ pancreas transplant. So somebody had to. Hans Solinger, also from the University of Wisconsin, another important figure in the history of pancreas transplantation. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the, the things that he developed in terms of the uh, actual anatomical uh, presentation of the pancreas in, in the transplant. So, okay, so we know that euglycemia is going to arrest or prevent the further development of your vascular disease. But what about the whole role of solid organ pancreas transplant in diabetes? Well, in the 60s, we figured out that we could do it, even if the results were terrible. We then sort of second-guessed ourselves in the 70s and said, well, should we do it? In the 80s, and I'll show you this, where we defined <coughs> the benefit of kidney transplant in these diabetic patients. In the 90s, there's plenty of studies which will show the significant role of the pancreas transplant in these diabetic patients, in addition to the effect of the kidney. And currently, we're still struggling with what is the optimal algorithm because we have choices in these patients. Should you just put in a kidney? Should you put in a living donor kidney? Should, should you put in a kidney and a pancreas together? Should you put in a living donor kidney and then a deceased donor pancreas after the fact? So you have to, a lot of questions, and some patients don't have choices, but in some patients there are choices and we 
sometimes struggle with what's the best for this particular patient. <coughs> the numbers really haven't changed. I mean, pancreas transplantation, if anything, has probably fallen off a little bit. There's about 1,200 a year. And the majority, and this is, I think, probably the confusing part with pancreas transplantation, the majority of pancreas transplants are done as a combined kidney and pancreas together. All the other little um, PTA, PAK, PALK, et cetera, it just gets confusing. The majority of patients who get a pancreas transplant get a kidney and a pancreas together called a simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant. Okay, so how do we tease out the effect of the kidney versus the effect of the pancreas in this population of patients? This was a really important study in showing the benefit of kidney transplantation. Essentially, what this does was this was a longitudinal <laughs> study of mortality. It took over a quarter million patients and followed them from the time of going on to dialysis to the time that they were selected out for transplant and on the waiting list. So you could say, well, you know, the patients that are selected out, they're going to be better patients. True. And the patients that get transplanted are going to be even better patients. But take a look at the numbers here. <coughs> a quarter of a million patients. There were 46,000 that were waitlisted. These were all being followed through to the patients that went on to get transplanted. If we look at the annual death rate, patients on dialysis, the annual death rate that's per 100 patient years is 16. Just by virtue of being selected out to go on the wait list, your mortality is decreased from 16 to 6. And then when you're selected out for your transplant, your mortality is halved. This is huge. If I was a patient on dialysis and I said, so if I stay on dialysis versus if I get picked out to get a transplant versus if I get a transplant. So kidney transplantation has a huge impact on these patients' lives in terms of their mortality. This is not a quality of life issue. This is an impact on mortality. You can further tease out, if you want to, the impact on the different age groups. Nevertheless, this is the same study. What they did was... And I always use this for my patients when they come in to be evaluated for kidney transplant. I say, well, when you come in for transplant, your risk for dying goes up by a factor of 2.8. Can you tolerate that increased risk? Eventually, you will benefit from the transplant. But we need to see if we can fumble through this period of time, anywhere from <coughs> five to seven months, or your risk of dying goes up by virtue of coming in for your transplant before you get your benefit, which is out here. And then when we compare the different categories of patients in terms of what their outcome is with kidney transplant now, just kidney alone, we see that the diabetic patients do the worst on dialysis and get the greatest benefit from transplant. And that's really important to see. Diabetic patients do the worst on dialysis and get the greatest benefit from transplant. So again, we still haven't answered the question, what about pancreas transplant? Is it really indicated? When is it indicated? <coughs> and what's the evidence? When you talk about pancreas transplantation, you do have to go back to the whole anatomy issue because this is kind of critically important when you're talking about putting in a pancreas graft. So the pancreas has two important arterial blood supplies. There's the splenic, which comes off the celiac. And then there's this IPDA, inferior pancreatic duodenal artery, that comes off the superior mesenteric. This forms a cascade. And a little known secret is that the gastroduodenal also feeds into this cascade in the head of the pancreas, which supplies the duodenum, the head of the pancreas. There is crosstalk between these two arterial supplies. So if you did injure your inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery, theoretically, you could use your gastroduodenal. The um, 
When we come to the pancreas transplantation, I'm sorry, I should mention that I'm not, not everybody is maybe a surgeon. When we take the, um, the pancreas for transplantation, we usually take it with the cuff of the duodenum here, and it comes out with the spleen. And um, essentially, when we revascularize this organ, some people will revascularize it with the spleen in situ, and some people will revascularize it without it. So it's dealer's choice. But you get a piece of bowel because in your pancreas, you have your exocrine secretions, which is about a liter and a half, and that has to be drained somewhere. And this drains through the pancreatic duct into the duodenal cuff, and your choices are to drain that exocrine secretion into the intestine, which is probably the most physiologic. But there was a time when they were draining it into the bladder because they basically had better wound healing with the immunosuppression of that time. So when we're doing pancreas transplantation, there's a huge amount of decisions to be made, many subjective. So when you see your kidney, pa your pancreas patient, should you do Say, so which cho choice of operation should you do? Which donors should you use? How important is the back table? I know that's a rhetorical question. And then, of course, at the end of it all, you have the transplant to do. But there's a huge amount that goes in before you even get to this final piece here, as in all transplants. When we're talking about using donors for pancreas transplant, most people are very selective. If there's two things that I look at, maybe three things that I look at when I get an organ offer, I want to know how old they are. I want to know what their BMI is, even if their BMI is not always a true reflection of their body fat. Um, and I want to know how they died. There's the three things that I think about. But everybody has their things that are more important to them than others. When we talk about no evidence of pancreatitis, oftentimes with head injury, the amylase will be elevated because you have amylase from your salivary glands. Plus, most of these people are dead because they've had some devastating injury, so there's a transient uh, ischemic event. Some people follow the liver enzymes very closely. If the liver is procured, well, then the pancreas is probably pretty good, too. The cold ischemic time is critical, in my opinion, because islets are very uh, dependent on oxygen, and that's what we talked about earlier, that they get 10% of the blood supply. They really don't like hypoxia. So a pancreas sitting in a bucket will just basically deteriorate over time, and it's your islets that you need. There are distinctions made between the different types. I don't tend to use extended criteria donor. Well, I know I don't use extended criteria donor pancreas, pancreases just because I don't have to because we have choices here in Texas. Uh, it's a luxury, but we have choices. I have used uh, DCD donors. Again, you can be incredibly selective. The 17-year-old, really thin, who basically expires very quickly. And then when you open the lesser sac and look at the pancreas and it's like, wow, you know you're, it's a reasonable one to take. So there's a huge amount of subjectivity when it comes to these um, organs that you're selecting. Now when you figure out what type of transplant you're going to do, then you've got to decide, you know, if you have a living donor, should you do it sequentially? Should you do the living donor along with the deceased donor pancreas? How should you drain it? Should you drain it into the bladder, drain it into the bowel? Should you use a rule limb? We talk about the venous drainage. You know, your pancreas normally drains by way of the portal system through the liver. And there was a huge amount of discussion at one point about the importance of this portal drainage and rejection. Because when we put in pancreases, the majority of us, they're drained into the systemic circulation. So you have a hyperinsulinemia in the systemic circulation, which some people felt was very critical. So there are advocates who say, you know, you should only drain the pancreas into the portal system. In my experience, you need to be able to do it in both ways because there's times when you can't put it into the systemic circulation and you have to do it into the portal system. 
It also depends on your immunosuppression era when you're interpreting any of this, these outcomes, because obviously the immunosuppression has become a little more sophisticated. And it depends on how long you're following these patients up and whether you're looking at the graph versus the patient outcome. I show you this picture because this is a picture of a pancreas here at a procurement. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the judgments that you use to use different organs are based on what you actually see when you open the lesser sac. It's a very subjective. There's no biopsy. You're looking at the history of the donor and you're looking at the actual organ. Or you're asking the surgeon who's procuring, what does it look like? When we reconstruct the pancreas, there, here is our Y graft. You know, I'm going to explain that to the people who have not, when you hear about what is this Y graft all about. Because you have the splenic artery and you have the branch from the inferior pancreatico duodenal artery, and they're fairly short arteries, to make the surgeon's life better, we use this graft. We extend the arterial conduit by using the uh, internal and external iliac Y graft from the donor. And then the, here's our venous outflow by way of the portal vein. And you know when you're in there struggling with the liver surgeons, no, I want a little bit more. Actually, I kind of like a short portal vein because it's probably a little safer. So everybody goes, oh, that looks pretty fatty when you use that. And I certainly didn't. But again, it's, this is where the subjectivity comes in. Yes, everybody would say, oh, that looks kind of nice, because you can easily see there's pancreas here. And this is kind of one of those, well, probably OK. So when we do the back table, the hardest part, I think, of the back table is not the reconstruction of the Y graft. Everybody seems to think that's the hardest part. It's making all these decisions. Do I tie this? Do I tie that? So we take the spleen off. I usually take the spleen off. Tie off the short gastrics. We tie off everything. Because when you unclamp that pancreas, if you haven't tied off everything, it'll be a bloody mess. This is the superior mesenteric artery here. And it's enmeshed in this all this lymphatic tissue. And I try to clean that off, tie it off. This is, this is the body and tail. This is the portal vein, the duodenum. And all these little black things here, these are uh, little ties. And I believe this is my graft. Yeah, it's a better one. The duodenal cup, we usually don't take it out of the, this is for illustration purposes only. We usually shorten the duodenal cuff and then over sew it because it's really important, of course, that you do not get any leaks. And this is what the Y graft looks like. So you've got your common iliac, your external, and your internal. And again, usually the most junior person is the person procuring all of these, and that sometimes will stretch and pull on these arteries, which really is not a good idea. And then this is the area, the angle of sorrow, if you like, right in the crotch here between the internal and the external. Uh, you want to avoid getting in any injuries there because obviously that's going to be very difficult to fix. So, you know, again, it's the experienced person should be procuring the vessels, not the most junior intern there at the do donor. And then we reconstruct with the internal to the splenic usually and the external to the superior mesenteric. So this is what it looks like. So you have a fairly long graft here. Now, when you actually go to sew it in, you can adjust that. And I, I have some pictures that I can show that. This is just sewing our Y graph, sort of showing off. But, oh well. So for cartoon purposes only, <clears throat> when I talk to patients about where their organs go, because they're not completely anatomically correct, the default for the pancreas is on the right side because of the way the vessels are rotated on that side. Now, normally the artery is lateral and the vein is medial. 
people in Minnesota make a huge deal, and I've sort of been indoctrinated into that, where that when they sew in the pancreas, if it's head down, actually the vein is on the lateral side and the artery is on the medial side because the internal iliac vein is ligated so that you don't have any twisting or kinking of the vessels. However, the default is to put the pancreas on the right side because of the way the vessels are rotated. Your options, of course, are to do a end to side or to do, I, I have been using Rue limbs because it's safer. I don't have to worry about leaks. Because if you have an enteric leak, it's usually not something you can salvage easily. And um, unfortunately, you don't always have the choice because sometimes patients will have had their kidney and you've got to do the pancreas on the other side. So you just have to think and plan out those vessels in terms of where they're going to lie, whether they're going to lie. When you ligate the internal iliac vein, it allows you and then you mobilize that vein so that there's no uh, potential for clotting of the portal vein. It makes it easier for you to sew it in. It's always good to know how to sew it into the bladder. And this is an option to keep in mind for if you're putting a pancreas in and after you revascularize, the duodenal cuff looks a little dusky and you're concerned about it. The safest option in that case is to drain it into the bladder because of the risk for if it leaks, it's not going to be quite as bad. Um, hopefully you're not going to be in that situation too often, but it's always good to know to be able to do that. And then to be aware that if you have a bladder-drained pancreas, there are metabolic consequences to that. <coughs> we need to be able to uh, put the pancreas in so that it's draining into the portal system as in this case here. Because if you've had lots of, if you're a retransplant, or if you've had issues going on down here, you need to be able to sometimes stay out of this area because it's a tiger country when there's lots of scarred down areas and uh, move up into the portal system. So, you know, it's, it's always nice to have somebody there to kind of tell you where to go next, but unfortunately as a pancreas transplanter, you're kind of really on your own. Um, and there are times when, you know, you wish that you chose something else. But that's the challenge of it all. This is just to show you the pain that we experience as transplant surgeons looking down into a hole at these vessels. And then where you can see these vessels here, this is the vein on this side arteries on this side, and somebody has planned this surgery out, so you've got the vessels staggered so that you're not trying to sew one on top of the other. And this is just with the dissection. And this is just to show you the portal vein. This is a pretty reasonably length, long portal vein, so usually it's hard to see that vein when you're <coughs> sewing it in. You're sort of looking underneath the uh, head of the pancreas. And this is more in situ illustrations. The vein is here, it's lateral, and then here's your artery going in here. And this is what a very happy pancreas looks like when it's been revascularized. And this is us again showing off our Y graft here. This is the body and tail, the head's here, and this is the ureter. You just have to make sure the ureter doesn't bowstring on top of your vascular anastomosis. And then, of course, you know, with your deceased donor, you have a corral patch for the kidney, and on a living donor, you don't. And this is why you become a little crazy, because this is what you're always thinking of. And if you haven't seen a thrombose pancreas, you probably haven't been transplanting enough. And we'll talk about what causes this pancreas to thrombose. It's a very sad situation to see, but as I say, if you haven't seen it, it's because you're not transplanting enough because you will see it sooner or later. And that's where it comes into the operating room, where we have our own neuroses. We're trying to push back against the neuroses of the anesthesiologist, because we just remembered that thrombosed pancreas. And some of our concerns are only anticipated based on our last experience, and some of these concerns are real. We're always struggling to figure out what's real and what's anticipated.
Again, back to being your neurotic surgeon. I mean, it really helps. I worry about hypoglycemia in the operating room because the patient's asleep. And it would be amazing to, re I mean, sometimes you don't realize that it, they don't always have dextrose available in the OR. So I do worry about hypoglycemia, and I tend to run the blood sugars on the higher side. I don't keep them tightly controlled when I'm transplanting them because it's safer. And we're always trying to balance, you know, we want our kidneys to look fantastic and our organs to look great. And then, of course, we sometimes will have to challenge that against the cardiac function. These are sick patients. <coughs> always the pressure of time, moving on, moving on, moving on, getting it sewn in. But at the same time, you have to have a meticulous technique. Bleeding or clotting, well, which would you prefer? So when it comes to pancreas transplantation, <clears throat> before revascularizing, you want to try to um, warn your anesthesiologist that you will lose some blood just because even though you've spent two hours on the back table, there will be some bleeding from the surface of the pancreas. And again, it depends on how you procured it. But bleeding is definitely better than clotting. Different protocols are used to protect against clotting in the pancreas transplant patients. I've used different ones. All patients get heparin in the operating room at the time of the transplant. But I've stopped using heparin after the transplant because of the risk for bleeding and the need to return to the operating room. So I've moved towards uh, using a colloid in aspirin and fersantine because I've had just as good results with that and obviously not as many problems with bleeding. But everybody's got their own bias. Edema is a bad thing for pancreas transplantation. So before you revascularize, and usually the kidney will be in first, you want to make sure that the patient is not too edematous because if the pancreas gets edematous, it raises the intertissue pressure, which makes it difficult to be perfused which makes it likely to clot off. So, you know, you've got to be kind of crazy. You take a pancreas from a dead person, uh, you do something to it on the back table, uh, you then take a patient who's been a diabetic for 25 years, plus or minus renal failure, you do vascular and bowel anastomoses. I mean, you must be crazy. You then add all these things in that impair wound healing. And it certainly helps. My secret ingredients are minimize cold ischemic time. There's two other things that, as surgeons, you do. You select your donors, and you select your recipients. After that, cold ischemic time. So how do these patients do? I mean, what, what's the point in struggling through all of this? We look at the unadjusted 1, 3, 5, and 10-year pancreas patients. This is the patient survival. This is broken down by the different types of pancreas transplant. And again, the most common one is the kidney and the pancreas together. That you move from one year in the 90s to 10 years in the 70s. Patient survival. If you look to the graft survival, Again, looking at all the different types, the simultaneous pancreas and kidney, graft survival, 85% in the first year. That's a little disconcerting. Moving down to 55% at 10 years. Why would anybody do this? Because of the pancreas graft to fail, this is always the conundrum. What's, what is causing this graft to fail? Because we talk about this bright purple area here or pink area here as technical failure. And as surgeons, we do not like technical failure. We take great pride in our work. But the technical failure that is the biggest cause of graft loss early on doesn't necessarily imply that you didn't put your stitch in correctly. The technical failure also encompasses uh, your choice of donors, your choice of recipients, and the way you lay out the organs in the patient so that there's no torsions. 
and also your perioperative management of these patients. So this is the 2004 IPTO report. So technical failure is the problem early on and the cause of your graft loss, not anything else. And it really didn't change in 2009. So it's part of the baggage that comes with pancreas transplantation. And that's why you spend a great deal of time choosing your donors, choosing your recipients, and being meticulous in your technique. And minimizing cold time is really critical. Pancreas does not like hypoxia. Why do these patients die? There's two big causes for these patients to die, whether you've had an SPK, a PAK, or a PTA. Cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, and then also infection, because you're now immunosuppressing these patients. So when people think of transplant, they think of rejection. Yes, rejection's important. But they're much more likely to die from infection and cardiovascular disease than anything else. So pancreases are immunological, it's part of an immunological disease. And so we talk about the immunology of pancreas transplantation. We've been challenged over the years, but clearly the advent of ProGraft, as it has for many organs, has really uh, revolutionized our management of these patients. Patients can get their original autoimmune disease back. It occurs in about 5%. But again, even though we stress about the immunology, most of these patients die from cardiovascular disease and infection. Now, what kind of transplant should you do? There are several papers that are out there, some with big groups, some with smaller groups, which will basically confirm that a kidney and a pancreas transplant together will improve your survival. This is not your quality of life. This is your survival compared to a kidney transplant alone. And we can break down each of these. Some of the, the Tiden and the Smeet studies are from parts of Europe. They basically had a similar demographic patients. And there was a significant difference, 80% mortality compared to 20% in the kidney patients alone versus the kidney pancreas patients. So I invite anybody to review these papers. Ojo and Bruce Kaplan did a really important study in my mind for this whole business of pancreas transplantation. Just as Wolf had done early on looking at the impact of kidney transplantation on diabetic patients or kidney transplant on patients per se, this is also a longitudinal study of mortality. So they basically took patients who are type 1, on the, uh, who basically started dialysis, and they followed them out to see what kind of transplant they had and how they did. This particular cartoon is showing you basically that the patients, when they come in for their kidney pancreas transplant, just like when they come in for a kidney transplant, the risk of death goes up. If they fumble through that part there, then their risk of dying goes down compared to the patients on dialysis. So we know kidney pancreas is better than dialysis. <coughs> okay, we all, we, I don't think we'll argue with that. If we um, look at it in terms of the days to equal risk, to equal survival, and so on and so forth, the extra life years of kidney pancreas transplant patients compared to patients on the wait list is estimated to be 23 years. That's a long time in a diabetic's life. And when they looked in the same study, whether they got a kidney pancreas together, a living donor kidney, or a deceased donor kidney, and followed out in terms of their days to equal risk, days to equal survival, what their relative risk of death was at five years. Not surprisingly, if you have a living donor kidney, you recover much faster. It's a smaller operation. And in five years, your relative risk of dying is 0.45. If you have a kidney and a pancreas together, it's going to take you a lot longer to recover. However, long term, you may do better. Compared to a deceased donor kidney, where your out long term outcome isn't as good. 
Now you can argue, well, these are different kidneys compared to these kidneys, compared to these kidneys. And even when you take all of that into account, patients who get either a combined kidney and pancreas together, they're almost saying that a kidney and a pancreas together is equivalent to a living donor kidney. But some people would argue that a combined kidney and pancreas together, and I'll show you the University of Wisconsin data, is actually superior to a living donor kidney. And what if you give a living donor kidney and a deceased donor pancreas at the same time? Are you getting the benefit of everything? So again, just to look at it in graphical terms, the outcome between a live donor kidney and a kidney and a pancreas together, in terms of their 10-year survival, were equivalent and certainly superior to a deceased donor kidney. So that as a diabetic patient, and you're looking, well, I'm on dialysis, well, I'm probably going to have eight years versus a kidney pancreas together, I get some extra life years here. And again, these are mathematical, these are predicted, but these, this was basically following this longitudinal group. Now, I should show, this initially was reported by the University of Wisconsin, which further supported a completely separate group of patients. This is from the University of Wisconsin database. They basically looked at their living donors, whether they are haploidentical or identical, and their outcomes with the, compared to the SBK versus a deceased donor. And they found very similar to the OJO study. The living donor kidney and the SBK are probably similar in their long-term outcome. But they followed their patients even longer, 20 years. This is a single database. And what they found was that actually, over time, there is a difference between a kidney pancreas and a living donor kidney. This is a 1,000 pancreases. This is a single database set where they reported the study. So at 10 years, they didn't actually, they felt that they were equivalent, but as they followed it out to 20 years, they found that a kidney and a pancreas together were superior. So, this is a little light relief. Sorry. A little bit more. So, Sometimes I feel like I'm the uh, Ignatio here to the patients because what you will see are patients who present to you because either their nephrologist said, well, when you quit peeing, give us a call, and they think there's nothing more than that, just dialysis, because there's not a lot of advocates for, for pancreas transplantation. The majority of my patients that come to the center have Googled and said, you offer pancreas transplant, tell me about it. So you actually have to um, realize that you're fairly much by yourself as Ignatio here because the endocrinologists don't really believe in you. The nephrologists are a little bit skeptical. And the patients, though, these are well-informed patients who want to know, what are my options? And it's not just a matter of not taking a couple of shots. There's mortality at stake here. So with each patient, I try to figure out how I can balance their current disease and their future potential benefit, because you're always trying to predict what the future is. You have to balance that against the consequences of immunosuppression, which we know are real, against the potential for disease reversal, or at least to arrest their disease, against what are you going to be waiting for in your particular OPO. What is it like to wait for a kidney and a pancreas in your OPO? Is it easy to get a kidney? Is it easier to get a pancreas only? So you have to tailor that to what your OPO offers you and your donor options if you have a living donor. Kind of look at it as you can pay up front, take on more risk. Down the road, you'll benefit. Or you can pay later. It sort of depends on each patient their potential risks, and what potential risks you're willing to take on, what potential risks they are willing to take on. So it really is a, a team event. These patients still have the highest mortality on dialysis, the greatest benefit from transplant. A kidney and a pancreas together is probably equal to, if not superior, to a living donor kidney. Still, 
the solid organ pancreas transplant is the only really sustained source of beta cell replacement therapy. People die from cardiovascular disease, and it's all about the team pancreas. It's all about the fact that you have somebody who's willing to go the extra mile, you have patients who are willing to work with you, and you have a great coordinator who's excited about the fact that you can give these patients a new chance. Thank you. Well, thanks for that wonderful talk. Um, the survival line that was missing on the graph you showed is a living donor kidney with a pancreas after the living donor. And I'm curious if there's information where that survival <coughs> falls relative to just living donor or simultaneous pancreas kidney. So that you're saying, it, what's the survival if you have a living donor kidney and then a pancreas afterwards? There is a paper that has been shown <clears throat> that the timing of the pancreas transplant after the kidney does seem to be relevant. So if you have the pancreas transplant, and I, I, I have the paper, I just can't think of the name. If you do the pancreas transplant within six to 12 months after your kidney, you basically will have the same benefit as a kidney and a pancreas together. So what do you counsel a uh, type 1 diabetic who has a potential living kidney donor? Well, I'll offer them a simultaneous, and again, depending on what the donor is willing to put up with, I'll offer them a simultaneous living donor kidney and deceased donor pancreas at the same time, because in our area, the uh, waiting time for an isolated pancreas is very short. And if that's uh, the, the route they want to go and the donor is willing to be on standby, uh, then that's what we'll do. So we've done probably 11 of those. It's a lot of work, but um, you know, you're getting the best of every world. You're getting a living donor kidney, and you're getting, and you actually have, I mean, you have to have your ORs as well willing to be available uh, to do your deceased or your living donor kidney sort of simultaneously. And um, so that is certainly one option. If the donors are not willing to be on standby, then um, you could offer them the living donor kidney, and then quickly after that do the pancreas. Certainly in patients who've had, um, there was one person who had had an aorta by fem, and uh, she had a living donor. So because of the technical aspects, I felt that it was safer to do the kidney first, see how she did, uh, sewing the kidney into the graft. And then six months later, she had her pancreas. Into did the graft. You sew that onto the graft or I go did. I, and, no, onto the graft. Um, I didn't do it with, without some concern, of course. Mm -hmm. I did a rule in. Is there ever evaluation of where this is a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant? Mm, no, I haven't. No, I, I say I've used both. I've done heparin or, or heparin effect. And all the patients bleed. So um, no, I think that I, I much prefer the, what I do now, which is to minimize the edema, uh, put them on for 48 hours. Again, I don't have the science behind this. 48 hours of albumin, chrysanthemum, and aspirin right away. And uh, sometimes I'll do daily ultrasounds, because there's no other way to know. Well, there is also there are also some studies which have shown that um, you can tease out the impact of losing the pancreas early on 
that it does impact the outcome. So even those kidneys which have been selected out by virtue of being kidney pancreases, those patients who, uh, so losing the pancreas does impact their outcome. So I don't think it's all, there, clearly there are better donors, but I, I also believe, I guess I do because I'm a pancreas surgeon, that um, the euglycemia that comes with the pancreas has a huge impact on their outcome. The other question I have is, if you follow the pancreas transplant in the wrong amount. I do. Okay, that's a key issue. Well, what I try to do is I partner with the patient's doctors. I am not a nephrologist. I am not an internist. I have no desire to be. But I do work with their doctors. So if they're in New Mexico or if they're in the Virgin Islands, I'm available to discuss with them. These are, most of these patients are very good support groups. That's why they managed to get to transplant. So even if they are not very uh, articulate, their family will be very supportive. And, um, you know, you develop relationships with these people over time. So you'll just have their doctors call you when they come across something that needs your input. Um, but essentially, cardiovascular disease is going to kill these people. So staying healthy cardiovascular-wise, fixing their lipids and their any other medical issues that they have is probably more important if they just don't mess with my drugs. And then I'm just available for consultation. And, and do you have, you know, you start off by doing things like pancreas biopsies? Yes. You have to be able to do pancreas biopsies. Nobody likes to biopsy a pancreas. It's a pretty scary thing because you know what happens when you... Right. So unfortunately, there's no other way to know what's going on with your patient. Now the kidney can be your surrogate when you have them from the same donor. Your urinary amylase can be helpful if you have a bladder drain pancreas. But at the end of the day, if you're waiting for hyperglycemia to tell you that something's wrong, your pancreas is gone. So yes, I and, and I usually work with the uh, interventional radiologist. I send them a series of slides first, like this is what, and I usually stay down there for the first one or two and try not to look, um, just so you can map out the lay of the land. Uh, I know in Minneapolis, many of the surgeons there, or at least one of the surgeons there, used to tack the tail of the pancreas up to the abdominal wall, so you could, yeah. So um, can you speak to the role of an insulin pump versus pancreas transplant? I mean, are there studies that look at kidney pancreas transplant versus kidney and an insulin pump? See, it's not all insulin. The problem is it's not all insulin. Most of the patients, I mean, with the glucose sensors and so on now, that's a different matter. If you're just talking about an insulin pump. It's not just all insulin. What the sensitivity that comes from this minute-to-minute -minute change that the pancreas gives you um, certainly appears to be superior to the insulin pump. However, if a patient wants an insulin pump and a kidney only, I'm not going to argue against that because the numbers are so small when you're trying to tease out what people's options are. It has to be their comfort level, and they have to be part of the team that this is what they want. If, and many of these patients um, are coming to say, I want the pancreas transplant. I'm not going out there saying, hey, we do pancreas transplants over here. So if patients are comfortable with the insulin pump and that is their choice, I mean, that's their choice. But if you have an option to do a kidney and a pancreas together, I think that's superior for their long-term outcome. I can't quote any, no. The numbers are all small in these studies is the problem. And you mentioned your donor selection criteria, but you didn't comment on recipient selection criteria. What are the potential pitfalls? To patients you wouldn't offer a pancreas 
if they don't understand what they're getting into, if they don't understand that early on there's go there are going to be issues, that you're going to have to work through them. I mean, you don't, somebody who's been a diabetic for 20 or 30 years doesn't get fixed with one operation. It's a process. So usually the first month or two is tough because they're pancreas patients. When I am choosing my patient, I think the um, obesity is a bad problem. I think you're looking for trouble. I have had uh, patients do gastric sleeves because obviously it can fix their gastroparesis and also impact, because you do see a lot of obese type 1 diabetics, if, for want of a better term. Obesity is a bad thing. You also want to be realistic about what you're hoping to achieve, whether you're talking about, because I have also transplanted a lot of blind patients. Um, the age of the patient, as you get older, over the age of 50, you're not going to benefit as much. Um, and your risk is going to be higher. Again, that's something you work with the patient. Um, so, I mean, with the new allocation system, you know, BMI and C-peptide are going to be having to be documented. So I don't really know what people have been transplanted in the past because we haven't had to put those in when we, because people would not be, they would self-select out, they wouldn't transplant obese patients, obese type 2 diabetics. So obesity, what level of disease that they have, what you're hoping to achieve, how much insulin they're currently taking, um, and to be realistic about what you can actually do for that patient. I actually agree with that because it's all insulin. And again, you're going to select out a very particular type of type 2 diabetics. You're going to select out patients who are thin. Who, um, I mean, what do you do for a type 2 diabetic? You give them insulin, right? So when you do a pancreas transplant, you're giving them insulin. Again, meeting that criteria of their BMI. And um, I mean, you also want to see that they're actually taking insulin. I mean, if they're not taking insulin. But when you fix these people's kidney, or when you fix their renal function, you know, the insulin requirements go up. So you have to be able to predict that too. So often you'll see the patient in the ICU and their insulin requirements are starting to go up. But their renal function's improving, so you're, you're trying to follow the pattern. Well, you certainly would think twice about that, but I have, I have uh, one patient that I can think of that was on over 100 units. Uh, he basically, uh, but he got control. It's not, to me, it's not a failure if you need to be on some insulin afterwards, as long as you have control. So if taking one shot of Lantus in a 24-hour period is going to be the difference between being on, you know, being controlled or not, so 100 units is a lot of insulin, but it, and I would counsel the patient that it wouldn't necessarily solve their issue, but if they had everything else going for them, then I think then I would transplant somebody. You know, you certainly are watching that. At the end of the day, you don't decide on the donor by virtue of how much, in, I mean, 10 units is a lot. But brain death is a huge physiological stress. Uh, you, and you don't really want to exhaust the islets. So I will certainly have considered donors who are on insulin, but 10 units would be pushing it a little bit. One last question. Um, where are we with islet transplantation? Where we were, I think, um, before. I mean, I think islets work. They clearly work. They don't last. We're still struggling with the whole isolation issue and the fact that you have to repeat the transplants, potentially sensitize the patients, and use fairly strong immunosuppression. So again, you know, we all come with our biases. Uh, I think there's a role for islets. Um, but I think it's m much more limited than, than a solid organ. Yes.